Oh, and I want to tell people to subscribe to Twitch to support, uh, you know, Masterpiece Theater type stuff. <laughs> support, support local theater. Support local theater. Yeah. <laughs> whoop, whoop. It's honestly fine. Yeah, let's just go. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's just this go. is what urban podcasting yeah. is like. Urban podcasting. We're an urban style podcast. <laughs> yeah, you can tell by the sirens going by all the time. Yeah. Okay, well. It's Monday. It's the Monday after the Super Bowl, the day that should be a national holiday. We're at the Chapo office here with Matt, Virgil, and Chris gathered around the water cooler. Everyone here at the company has got one thing on their brain, one thing they want to talk about. Uh, the big game last night. Boy, you guys check out that game. That was, that was really something. That the, was game, a, the game with the pigskin. The, that football game, uh, edge of your seat entertainment the whole it time. It was a real barn. <laughs> it was a home uh, dinger. It was a real barn builder. <laughs> uh, and I actually remember just I realize now that one of our early episodes was when the they won because I guess now they're just winning every other year. That's mm-hmm. the Patriots. Patriots. And we talked. It was right after Trump had been elected. And we talked about how like this is just a good symbol of the way nothing can get better in this country is this dull machine team just winning these joyless games. <laughs> and then we had that brief respite when the fucking the fucking Eagles the they Eagles, went in there, they, yeah. the, they fucking chucked that pigskin, they won the game. Guys were fucking doing cocaine on uh eating on children and eating horse shit. And, horseshit. In the and it's like maybe there is some hope in this world. And then we were reminded this year, no. Not only will they keep winning, they will do it in increasingly just ugly and nasty fashion. It's like football is now Brechtian. <laughs> It's just <laughs> this soul-crushing thing where all of the fun artifice, the, the edifice of, of the bread and circus's cultural enjoyment, the sugary treats we're supposed to enjoy as the, as the benefit of being in this, this grinding empire that's wheezing towards its death, it's, all that's falling away and all you have is the mechanism of it. We'll play a game for three hours. You'll watch it. It will be dog shit. Your soul will die for every minute. All the commercials will have the form of epic meme commercials. Right. But, they, but the content is but all just, forgettable. Everyone's oh, already absolutely. forgotten. Uh, uh, effinescent, meaningless. The game itself will just poke you in the eye. It, it, it's just the rules determine everything. All grace and ex- unexpectedness and, and interest is gone. Uh, uh, it's like got, watching guys doing their taxes with their bodies. I uh, right before we started the the stream uh, last night, I got a voicemail from my dad who was watching the pregame, and he was just like, "Are you watching this? What a terrible country!" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't want to get too a uh, goth eyeliner kid. Uh, oh, sports ball! But the spectacle of the Super Bowl is a concentrated dose of cancer to your soul. It's yeah. like everything about it, from the militarism to the stupid pomposity, these airheaded announcers saying the word football in front of every fucking word, because it can't be a field, it can't be a ball, it can't be players, it's football, because we're playing in the National Football League. And, it just, this, this, and that is fused with the military state, and then with corporate culture and all these fucking commercials, just th- these glistening, sweating attempts to be relevant or woke, like I believe there was another Martin Luther King thing, or like there was John Lewis in a fucking ad or something like that. And it's just, it's everything in a blender of shit. And yet, the, 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 150, 200 million people are Yeah, that's, that's the real dispiriting thing. It's like, it gets worse and worse and more, more alienating, but we're locked in and there's no alternative, I, so we just keep I doing it. Well, you say that, I, I think the alternative is community theater. And See, that's the thing. We, last night, provided a ray of hope in this, this dark just gloomy cultural landscape. A shaft of light broke through the overcla- overcoverage. A wifely solitude will be on the In the Criterion Collection soon. Absolutely. And on Coming, YouTube uh, also, Q3 hopefully. 2019. I, I'm going to uh, I'm gonna put wifely solitude on YouTube hopefully tonight. Uh, I'm going to fix the uh, the sync issues. I'm a, oh, fix, I'm a fix wifely solitude. Excellent. If you mix, missed the Chapo counter halftime And shame show, on you if you did. Shame on you, though I forget if we actually told people about no, it. No, we told <laughs> Uh, you know, it's my personal uh, Barry Lyndon. Yeah, we <laughs> we wrote and performed a sort of Edwardian chamber drama in to watch instead of uh, Adam Levine's nipples, and it was heartfelt and and brilliant. And if you didn't like it, honestly, uh, you're a sow, and I have yeah. no respect for your opinion. Yeah. Well, uh, the game, the big game's over. Uh, the Bud Knight is dead. Long live the Bud Knight. Uh, but why don't we go into uh, 
our regular our regular format, and I want to kick off the show this week talking about a a moment from our sister podcast, uh, Pod Pod Save America, that uh, went viral this week. That I think is um, very interesting and um, worth listening to in whole and providing our reaction to because I, I think it's very indicative of where. Democratic Party politics are going in the next two years. Well, I like hearing outside perspectives. That's what the show is all about. So this is uh, one of the Johns or Dan's or Tommy's. I don't know who this guy is, but let, let's just listen to, to what he has to say here about about health care. There are legitimate policy arguments in favor of a uh, an act, a Medicare access approach as opposed to a Medicare for all approach that is not ideological in the sense that it doesn't make you less liberal and it doesn't make it doesn't make you less progressive to view it as a positive outcome because again we are all going to end up paying for health care the goal the ultimate goal here is not a process one it does it is not you know they're a private health care plan versus a medicare plan if you have good insurance that you can afford that protects you when you need it most that gives you the option to get the, the preventative care that you need without bankrupt you and your family that makes you feel safe and protected that is the goal as a country our goal totally. is to pay for everyone's health care in a way that doesn't eat up a greater and greater share of our gross domestic product that is the ultimate goal. The debate about policy, the debate about process is a really, really important one, but it should not be always reduced to this ideological question as to whether or not you're going along with Bernie or if you're part of the neoliberals. It just is It is more complicated and a, a more nuanced than that. God damn it. This is why I love healthcare as a subject, and this is why I think it needs to be the, the thin point of the wedge because you see these desperate guys trying to prevent people from realizing the actual ideological stakes at hand here and the real ideological differences and, and the real structural differences that liberalism and leftism are when they uh, are applied to government and, and politics. Uh, what I love so much about uh, that clip is just like he's sort of like stammering and quavering as he just like pleads with his audience that like, listen, the Medicare for all approach and the access to Medicare yeah. for approach, it's not ideological it doesn't mean you're any more or less liberal if you favor one over the other so i'm going to go into jordan peterson here but he's the same uh <laughs> quavering. quavering uh pleading that that is going Weedling. on here and you know we've talked about this many times on the show with libby watson or amber or others about medicare for all or just the issue of health care uh in general You'll, you'll notice like a, a couple, the couple of the key words that are always tells. I mean, he, he, the first one he tells himself because he compares the access approach. Like yeah. access is a huge tell. But if you pay attention in that clip, the other big tell that he's giving you that he's not aware of is the word affordable. Mm -hmm. Affordable is going to be that's going to be the big buzzword because we're seeing a situation now in which uh, Medicare for all polls extremely highly, not just among Democratic voters, but the population overall. You're seeing people like Kamala Harris and you know other Democratic hopefuls uh, sign on as part of their, their platform to say, hey, they just put it on a list of things that they support. Yeah, I'm for Medicare for all. But at the same time, you know, we know for sure that the people who create policy for Democrats and more importantly, the people who underwrite them certainly don't want anything no. like a universal single payer no, no, system no, 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 no. or any kind of universal approach to healthcare. So what you're going to see uh, coming starting now and going to become more and more intense as you know, people have to get m drilled down more into this is this very elaborate and relentless attempt to obfuscate what Medicare for all means. Yes. And that is what uh, Tommy John or whoever that was is attempting to do there and to tell you that, you know, and to plead with you that it's not about ideology or that ideology doesn't matter and that, like what really matters is just you want everyone to have health care. And it's just like, well, okay, well, how, well, what does that mean? Is that how these guys talk on the show regularly? Because it's just, it's mostly just political bullshit speak. Well, let's you know, ask, we, we the people demand affordable access, let's not ask, access to affordability. Let's ask, uh, we have a resource at our disposal. We, I just found this out. People make fun of me for watching Saturday Night Live every week. But, Chris, I think you have something to tell us. Yes, much like uh, Matt just needs to know what they're up to on SNL. I just need to know what they're up to on Pod Save America. And I do listen to almost every episode of That's right, folks. Pod Save America. We've got a pod head. Breaking We've news got a here. friend yeah. of the pod. Look, i got to keep up with the abreast with the competition. That's. I mean, it's true. It's, once again, you're the only one of us doing due diligence. <laughs> I mean, I would say that they do. They probably get into bigger policy conversations like this. Uh, less frequently than just rundowns of uh, you know the news or what's new with Russia, which they cover 
basically every week. I bet Trump's really in trouble now. Yeah, he's always <laughs> very in trouble. Um, it's always uh, <laughs> not good, Dan. <laughs> uh, oh, but um, the, the one thing I will say is that I'm like broadly sympathetic to one of the points that they're saying, which is that it, this is going to have to be a big policy fight within the Democratic primary, and we're going to need to figure out what everybody means when they are saying Medicare for all, and that's going to be, and it, there is going to be work to convince people that your take on Medicare for all is the right one, and that's something that's going to have to be hashed out. But the thing that for them is that's the end of the sentence for them. Yeah, they are defending the idea that there will need to be a defense of ideas, yeah. and never go further into saying, and this one type of idea or this one ideology will be better for more people. Exactly, or will. They're like, anything that comes out of this is going to be good because it's going to be affordable yes. access for everyone. Well, even as, if that as, means as you that said, well, well, the word affordable yeah. is the tell because affordable is subjective. Affordable to who? Yeah. And, and then as you, as you said, Matt, like once you're introducing the concept of affordability, you're introducing the concept of means testing. Right. And that like the way nothing the modern like liberal technocracy can ever produce can ever be anything that's just simple. Yeah. That's just like universal coverage free at the point of service for everyone no right. matter what yeah. you don't have to fucking worry about it or think about it yes. always has to be you know some like you know deferred tax savings account yeah. or it's all just about like you know making you uh, have to figure out and you know basically just do your taxes well, it's a like consumer nobody yeah. fucking approach. understands your, or, the idea is that you're supposed to be a consumer of a product of healthcare and so you have to navigate the marketplace and this this whole segment came from them responding to Kamala Harris's uh, yeah oh, I, I, support, I support destroying the insurance industry and the next day her, her people being like no she doesn't really <laughs> that, was, yeah, so that was really yeah. good wow yeah uh, um, fantastic and that's what they were responding to in this and and you know they are all four ex-obama guys and i think the even deeper funniest thing about this whole segment was it was like seven to ten minutes of them just uh, as i said online sweatily running laps around how to avoid another if you like your insurance you can keep it thing about about being like well, well we can't like break promises and then make a backup uh, and people like some you know, sometimes that one uh, tiny shield of a thing that's keeping them alive, their employer-given health insurance, they have some affinity to that. Sure, See, because right. it's the only thing that they have. Yeah, that's that, the, that's the nub of it. Yeah. Yeah. See, now, now, there's two things going on. One is the actual thing, which is that the Democratic Bar Party's actual rulers and, and the, the, the interests of these motherfuckers is not for getting rid of ins the insurance industry right. and for nationalizing health care in any meaningful way. They don't want that. And that, that is the... But that reality they want to obfuscate because that makes it just look like hey look we've got etna to deal with we don't want to mess with them or, and or that's good that people are like really what is politics if we're just gonna like be at the whim of these fucking or, vampires yeah or on a deeper level they're uh a maybe slightly different level it's not that they can can't even imagine wanting to get rid of that thing or, or have that thought percolate in their head because it's too scary yeah the idea of taking on i mean at least it seems the idea of dismantling an industry that big yeah. for something that could possibly be a good a, a greater human good is just too too scary of an idea there's going to be too much backlash people are going to be uh, wigged out by by this possibility we can't even we can't even we we need to win the next election we can't think ideas well yeah. i mean to be sure there will be huge backlash yes. and it is a huge endeavor and i mean the, the, and uh you know Carl Rove had an op-ed in the Wall Street <laughs> Journal uh you know making the case the same case you know the the sort of oh yeah medicare for all polls very high but like that poll like is 70 percent like you know cuts and gets cut in half when you explain or like when you tell people in the poll that like they're going to lose their employer provided and that's been as well. that's the hook for all of this that, backlash yes, exactly. from the democrats because they because you have the senate like i'm saying you've got the one level of the cynical people who are actually just beholden to fucking the insurance industry and then you have the terrified regular libs who aren't necessarily committed to the insurance industry but are just awfully always terrified of losing and as soon as i hear ooh, this people like their insurance they shoot that fucking cloud of squid ink and terror. Yes. And that's when the cynical people can exploit that and say, ah, see, it's more complicated than that. We should really be thinking about yes. expanding access and using affordability and smother them with all those fucking fake buzzwords. But the fact is, 70% of people like their fucking health, want to keep their health insurance because the alternative in a world where everything only gets worse is just like an empty fucking chasm. And it's, you, you, no one and people like their insurance until they have to use it. Yeah, they usually don't actually enjoy paying as much well, no, as they what are. People even actually when they have like, uh, uh, employer 
employer based insurance. What people actually like about their employer based insurance is not necessarily that it's 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 objectively good or comparatively good to uh, Medicare or anything else like that. They like it because they don't have to worry about it. Yes. Very many times they're not paying premiums, or at least I mean they technically are, but it's just, so it's just all going, going from their the employer. Right. Uh, they like it because like, I don't have to be anxious about it. I don't have to navigate a market. I don't have to think about a, a government bureaucracy or whatever. I, uh, and as well, uh, chances are I'm young and healthy and in the workforce, I've never had to use it yeah. in any serious way. Right. I've never uh, been in a situation, but everyone's familiar with situations where, uh, somebody who has the good private health insurance, uh, still gets a fucking $50,000 bill because, uh, they uh, they were unconscious and an ambulance took them to an out of network hospital. Yeah. And, but the thing is, is that. Like they, they, they cling to this, ooh, people are going to be scared of the change. One, that ignores the fact that anything you try to propose is going to get fear-mongered. Obamacare was the wet dream of all the techno-liberals, and it was supposed to preserve all the things that people liked and prevent alienation and backlash. And it was still treated by, including, by Republicans and the fucking insurance companies as this monstrous Stalinist takeover, and they, they still treated it that way. So you're not getting off the hook. Even yeah, if you get the thing, and remember the original, you're not getting off the hook. Remember, uh, the original idea of, of, of Medicare for all is this is kind of a, a Luntzian uh, uh, attempt to uh, uh, frame the narrative uh, by appealing to people's sense that Medicare is an extremely, extremely popular and well-functioning government program. So we're just going to slap that name on it. And when it comes to the fact that, yes, a lot of people who uh, uh, have currently have health insurance uh, and they don't have to worry about it. I still think that in the back of their minds, they think, well, I do have insurance and I feel safe, but I could get fucked any day. Like I, something bad could happen because those people uh, fundamentally don't have my best interest in mind. And I think that if you want to, if you have to go through those people, these like, you know, middle upper middle class professionals who have uh, employer based health insurance, I think you have to appeal to their fundamental sense of anxiety about that. I know, like, the, and the, the the backlash or people's fear about big changes to something like their health care, I think, is is real and it can't be uh, waved yeah. away. But however, it's like the the answer to that is explain to people that look, you don't really like your fucking insurance company. No, you like you you like it when you have to use it for something, or like, God forbid, if anything really bad happened, would you? I think you'd find out that how and fucking this useless it is. is. I think the answer to that is to say. Yeah, okay. Like, yeah, your employer backed health insurance. Yeah, you're going to lose that. But in its place, you're never going to have to talk to a fucking insurance company. You're never yeah. going to have to go through a phone tree of like automated responses saying operator, operator over and over again as you're like bleeding out. <laughs> and then even better than that, no co pays, no fees, no deductibles, no premiums well, ever. Well, you're never going to have to learn anything. And, and yes. that's what they that's what they forget because they never, they always assume the end point because they're never thinking of politics. They're always thinking of, policy because that thing that's what makes them think they're smart even though you only get to the policy by having an effective politics that gets you in that room in the first place they always assume they're in the room and so for them okay you're trying to get a focus group of you know uh, slack jawed yokels to sign on for medicare for all but they're too scared of the alternative oh i don't know i like my church because that's how they see the hogs obviously uh but that the idea is once you're in that, you if you've campaigned on Medicare for all, it's not just a slogan anymore. It's a concept. It is an alternative. You're presenting an alternative to this shit world we're in that people could be like, okay, maybe I'm not so scared of losing my insurance anymore. And also, that's how you get people to fucking vote for it because it's simple and it's it, it engages people and it's something they can grasp quickly. Any of these fucking affordability alternatives. They know this. It's just Obamacare all over again. Yeah. It has to be. If you're and preserving the, private I, you, uh, insurance, if you're preserving uh, 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 employer-based insurance, then it's a it's a Rube Goldberg contraption of you, subsidies you, you, and, sh and, 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 and plans and shit like that. And it's the same thing that alienates and makes people check out every time when you're trying to propose reform. You have to go to war with private health insurance interests if you want to make any structural change to the healthcare sector in this society. And that's a fact. And, you know, we learned that lesson from uh, one, the ACA, which was built, uh, it was built to win the support of the private health insurers uh, because they had internalized lessons of Hillary care in 1993, 
where the, uh, the, the Clinton administration did not really want to go to war with health insurers, but the, everything they proposed, the health insurers just said no to. And then they this is, uh, put their money uh, in order to sink that. And as Ryan Cooper points out, there is something like, what, a trillion dollars in profits, private profits in the, just the health insurance industry overall. A significant amount of that money is going to go to fight any sort of structural change to, to the way people get health care in this country that threatens private profits. So you have to go for the jugular on that. You have to have a campaign to demonize every health insurer, ideally the uh, CEOs and the major stakeholders in these health insurance companies. There's no way around it. And it's obvious that uh, uh, certain people like Booker and Harris uh, don't have the spine to do that. I just wanted to point out uh, along the same, I, and I believe that a new raft of polling came out, or, or maybe even just one new poll came out recently about how people respond to certain issues. And I think that this is something that like Carl Rove was responding to, uh, but this is actually something Libby Watson points out in mm -hmm. her uh, s recent Splinter article about single payer. Is that in the same polls where they ask questions that are individual, like what, how would you feel if your private insurance disappeared tomorrow? Like most people would respond to questions <laughs> like that as how would you poorly. feel if you woke up in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean grafting driftwood? <laughs> yes, exactly. Most people <laughs> I respond would to like that. that. that so there's bad. like all these different gradations in the same poll that people, you know, if, when you just get a one line question, you're like, yeah, that sounds yeah. bad. But in that same poll, and I'm reading straight from Libby now, the poll also found that a majority of Americans support, quote, having a national health plan, something called Medicare for All, in which all Americans would get their insurance from a single government plan. The majority, so the majority uh, uh, supported that. Uh, and as she says, which would seem to be the ball game to me, but whatever. And that's true. Like if, when you, so you can come at this issue from different ways and the different responses to it will can be used to support these various uh, points because of view. If you want to talk about doing the politics of it, they yeah. just think of it as like this is this is the uh, public opinion, and there's nothing to be done yeah, with yeah. it. You just work with it. And if you want to talk about public opinion or like messaging or engaging people's you know imaginations or just the lived experience of their everyday life, uh, compare you know what the Johns are saying or like anyone else who tries to obfuscate this by saying, oh, it's actually more nuanced and complicated. You know, we have to be, uh, you know of access and tax deferred savings accounts and shit like that. Compare that to what I always think about whenever I think about this was what Libby herself wrote about her, her own family's experience with the NHS in the UK and uh, her mom's illness is when she said every day, the NHS gives my mother life for free. Yeah. And like, that's what's at stake here. And that's, that is the horizon of, of what of possibility. Yeah. And what people can understand. Secondly, I, I want to read this one thing now. This is from Amy Klobuchar. Oh, this is this is a tweet she had this week that, again, I think... She's, by the way, a, she is likely running for president. Somebody in D.C. found, I guess one of her staff members left an, a folder of of uh, test images for their campaign literature. And her, her, her uh, symbol is like this triangle. It looks like something from a fucking horror movie. It's, it's like this triangle with like a, a little uh, mountain on it. This is what she tweeted last week. She says uh, here, the American workforce is changing and there isn't one path to success. Oh I've introduced bipartisan legislation with Senator Sass. Pause. Oh. Pause. Okay. If you've got Ben Sass to sign on to any piece of legislation, it's dog shit. It's, yeah. it's worthless. And we'll do more. It's absolutely fine. do more harm than yeah, good. That absolutely. guy is a pig. Awful. Uh, one of the worst. He, nothing he believes in is good. Uh, if, he, if, if he agrees with you, you're wrong. Start again. The American workforce is changing, and there isn't one path to success. I've introduced bipartisan legislation with Senator Sass to allow people to use tax advantage savings accounts to pay for educational expenses, life skills trainings, apprenticeships, and professional development. Go off, Queen! Yes! This is the shit. We are living in the workforce that we've always dreamed of. Oh, my God. You have it's more so paths to success at your fingertip than previous generations had Woo. in their entire lives. This is my shit. And I just want to say here, I forget who said it, but someone responding to this said, like, the, 20, like, like the 2020 election is not going to be decided by the left. Yeah. It's going to be decided by everyone who hears the phrase, tax advantage savings account on MSNBC and just fucking gives up like they did the last time. Yep. It just completely tunes out. Or decides just... to vote for Trump again because he's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> this is, that was, that's so good. And a Jacob Bacharach, friend of the show, pointed out that this, I mean, even on its own merits, this is a garbage non-reform because those savings accounts are obviously not accessed by people who don't have any money because you don't have money to save. And they 
are too they give too shitty return for rich people to bother with. Yeah. So there's not even there's no. Who's this for? It's for no one. It's yeah. for, for no one. Literally like, nobody. It's to look like you're doing something. It is. It's 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 make work. For a senator to look like she has a portfolio for a president, you buy We're gonna do bipartisan, yeah. exactly. And um, to another point. By the I, way, she's absolutely right. There are so many paths to become successful in America now: finding buried treasure, inventing a new type of pornography. A long lost uncle dies and bequeaths you his mansion. Absolutely, but it's Kidna- once it, and you have to stay in it for one night. Oh yeah. yes, kidnap a, a local industrialist's fancy lad son. But and then uh, you pay them to give it back because like, he like, turns up like, being uh, such oh, an Henry asshole. Henry story. Yeah, yeah. No, mo- moving on now. I want to. Uh, I want to. I just about- want to say one thing. Yeah, yeah. Finally, like the cop this off. Realistically, I don't even think even if, best case scenario in twenty twenty, Bernie wins and they bring in a whole fresh batch of little Bernie baby bros in the Congress to yeah. back him up. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you're going to get Medicare for all in the near future anyway, because we have the United States Senate and the Supreme Court to deal with, and there's no, there is not at this point. The political, the political capital, the political mobiliz- mobilized force to sidestep or neutralize those institutions. What Medicare for All does, what a Bernie campaign would do, what this entire political season is going to do, if it's going to have any value at all, and that's still up in the air, is to heighten the contradictions within the Democratic coalition mm-hmm. and expose the ideological fault lines that have until this point been totally covered up intentionally by people like the fucking Johns. And by saying these are two distinct approaches to politics and policy. And that, yes, ideology does matter. And that ideology matters. And that the reason these guys don't want Medicare for all, it's not because they're too goddamn smart. It's not because they're Mr. Too Damn Wonk and they understand how complicated it is. It's because they have vested interests that are opposed to that reform. And that is the only way that electoral politics has any meaning in the near future. Uh, I just want to say this then. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of obfuscations like you heard from the Nega Johns uh, about, you know, oh, uh, we, uh, we we just want to expand access to Medicare or just have some like government public option that's going to coexist with private health insurance. Uh, that's not going to work. And if you are on that side, you are, you are carrying water for capital. I understand it if you're Kamala Harris and you say that because presumably you or, or your allies take a lot of money from the health insurance company. If you're a fucking podcast host not getting paid by anyone to say that, uh, you're a stooge. That's it. The existence of a trillion dollars a year in profits going into private hands uh, uh, from the health insurance industry is a knife at all of our throats. And any sort of attempt to accommodate that trillion dollar revenue stream uh, by making some sort of minor reform, uh, that's going to fall flat on its face. Even if there is a public option, that's what they attempted. That's what they attempted in the Obama administration. And we ended up with the ACA, which pisses everyone off. To your point, though, and as, as, as you said earlier, Virgil, like it is unavoidable if you'd like to have a more humane society that you have to identify enemies, enemies, i.e. health insurance companies and the people who run them. Uh, which brings us to uh, the next topic I want to talk about. Well, I'd just uh, like to say that uh, I personally would love for any of the Johns, Dan, or Tommy to come on and debate these ideas with us, and the winner of said debate can either uh, gets to choose to either give or not give a nuclear weapon to Iran. <laughs> <laughs> just what, also, just very quickly, nerd people will go, eh, actually, all of these uh, precious, all your precious universal programs in other countries, they have private insurance. Yeah, they're this, there's, it's a tiny appendix industry that exists to supplement and fill some cracks it's just like if you have money to afford it you can get hbo in your exactly. hospital room. or like, or like it defray the cost of like have, the they, actual copay you have to do like there's, or, they have or, private insurance yeah. in iran yeah like, they have it's, kind of, yeah. It's canada it, nhs has private, but it does not own the entire fucking uh health market the, it, it doesn't it is not the it does not set the parameters of health care in the country okay but uh to my broader point, this idea about identifying enemies is one approach. Then yeah. there's another approach, um, perhaps best embodied by the latest absolute dud to enter the Democratic <laughs> race in 2020. I'm talking, of course, about Crory Brookings Institute. Crory, uh, Crory, Crory, Crory Bookman um, is basically explicitly running a campaign on, I think his motto is basically, I'm running because I love everyone. Yeah. And, and he, he embodies. He's Molly and he just wants to hug everyone <laughs> yeah. in America. And I think he embodies this tendency in, you know, modern liberal politics is that they, they genuinely believe that um, a, a politics about that where that identifies bad people and enemies to a common good 
uh, is gauche. Yeah. Or, or at gauche at best, or actually evil and authoritarian at worst. It's uh, populist. Can't have that. Cory Booker, absolute fucking turkey, uh, announced this week. Um, say, oh God, what did he say? He said, I got my degree at Stanford, <laughs> but my PhD on the streets of Newark. Hell yes. Cory Booker. I mean, just one of the most laughable, fraudulent stooges. He got his it's PhD. Just really unbelievable. He got his PhD in getting cats out of trees and t- interacting with made-up drug dealers. Yeah, T Bone. Let's not forget his friend T Bone. Uh, he was not there at the campaign announcement, but no, Cory Booker is running. Uh, you know, a, a love everybody, bring everyone together campaign. And I'm sorry, that that's fucking DOA. Yeah, it's DOA from an electoral standpoint, or just basically purely on like if you want a Democrat to defeat Trump and get elected. And it's also dead morally. Yes. Well, don't forget that Cory Booker did clean up the mean streets of Newark. He uh, kicked out the infamous Choon Gang. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Cory Booker uh, sold the public schools to Facebook. Uh, Cory Booker has already said that he would not do away with the filibuster and he would not abolish private insurance. Hell yeah. Go so, on, again, already DOA. Yeah. I mean... Well, well that's the thing. It's, 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 and we talk about needing enemies and how that is vital and you, and you look at these guys... I mean, no, we don't need... I'd rather not have enemies, right. but, but they I mean, exist. You need to identify enemies. Yeah. You need, the need to identify enemies is, is necessary. And you, you say, well, these guys are politicians. They want to win... Why wouldn't they realize the effect efficacy of this? It's because if you recognize, if you do operate on the principle of these are the enemies to us, the finger is going to point towards everyone who supports your campaign. And that's just, that is too fundamental uh, a element of your career and of the architecture of the party to ever be confronted, even if it would be good politics. Because you'd be cutting off your nose. Let, let's not also, face. let's also not forget that uh, Cory Brooker spent a lot of his early career having this sort of like weird, like bozo friendship with the rabbi Shmuley Beotech. Yep, yep. I mean, one of the most dingbat grifters alive, as well, in, you know, in addition to actually being like an evil lunatic. Yep, right. uh, so, yeah, that's also very promising as far as, you know, his future uh, beliefs or hopes for America. Yeah. No, oh, he, how I like you to criticize someone for having friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I would really look forward to Booker getting in there. And then, you know, he's his his announcements of the bombing of Tehran while like wearing a Barney suit or something. <laughs> well, because if you want to talk about someone, you might fucking go to war in Iran. Cory Booker is a very good candidate. Again, not much more to say about um, Cory Bookman, but other than I'm very much looking forward to him getting like two or three percent in Iowa and then just disappearing forever he spoke at a charter school like like a week or so ago while the la teachers were on strike on that very issue about school privatization and uh to his credit you know he was in new orleans where uh every school is a charter school now yes like entirely privatized uh, system we talked about it when it was happening shortly after our uh episode about the la uh, teacher strike uh it was resolved in favor of the teachers and I think we can say with full confidence that was 100% due to the, our show. <laughs> yes, due to our show. So I mean, Thank you, Matt the, and Virgil. The, yeah. You're welcome. And, you the one, and, the, a pleasure. and the one thing is, uh, I should hope that the union movement, you know, which has kind of been feeling its oats in the past couple of years right now, and is, you know, really, really going on a rampage post this Janus decision, uh, that they just say no to Cory Booker. Like, that's it. In full. I mean, I'm pretty sure the teachers are going to say no. I, I, I do think it's interesting... And Booker's the second one to wade into this. That the uh, the breaking the filibuster thing is going to end up being kind of a flashpoint issue. I mean, it has to be, yeah, because someone like, there are, there is a growing realization among Democrats, a very self interested one, that oh, we should probably do something about the the absolute banana republic state of voting in this country, the the patchwork of local fiefdoms doing all kinds of suppressive maneuvers just out of the interest of our our, our winning elections, but that also run. But then there's the deeper issue of the structural barriers to any change that exist in well, things like the I think Senate. it's important to point out, though, when, uh, when Booker said he does not want to do away with the filibuster, uh, the excuse that he used involved a completely um, horseshit understanding of American history. You know, another a fairy tale that uh, the filibuster is important to... Uh, you know, protect the rights of minorities from, you know, the rampaging mob. And it's important, you know, for, I mean, for comedy, I mean, forget that, but it was basically the idea that, like, we need the filibuster as, like, a, the final uh, protection or fail The only time that ever that, happened. That is literally, it, it, the filibuster has overwhelmingly in American history been used to take away the rights the of minorities. The only time that ever happened was in the movie Mr. Smith Goes to yep. Washington. <laughs> 
Yeah. But because of the, uh, the filibuster wasn't really an issue in politics for a long time because it was considered an extraordinary thing. The, Mitch McConnell really did revolutionize politics by just saying, yeah, we're just going to filibuster everything. And the Democrats were totally flat-footed because they didn't know what to do because nobody had done that before. For the longest time, filibusters were almost exclusively used to prevent the passage of civil rights legislation and anti-lynching laws. That's what they were for. That's well, it. The filibuster exists to protect the rights of a minority if you stipulate that that minority is the deeply hidebound reactionary rump, 20, yeah. 25% of American right. like aging white lunatics. Yeah. And the thing is, is that they will say, well, what if we're out of power? It's like, well, you know You what? don't have power now. Exactly. And you're not going to get it if you keep doing this weak sauce bullshit and get your ass kicked after disillusioning people like Obama did. And also, if you do real meaningful radical reforms, guess what? They can't be undone. Yeah. Social Security is still around. Medicare is still around. That's I mean, that's really the important thing. Let's say you have a, a Democratic trifecta going to 2021 uh, and you have like, I don't know, 53 Democratic senators. It's probably the high water mark at this fucking Absolute point uh, who you might be able to drag away from oblivion. Uh, you have one shot to shoot. And you better make it count. And something like uh, the HR1 right now, the package electoral forms, okay, that might actually go a long way towards structurally ensuring that you have at least an opportunity for a majority to actually rule in this country and a majority to actually vote in this country. And if you're Cory Booker, or even better, anyone running against him, I mean, I think he should be made to make a defense that, uh, yeah, the rump of MAGA America should have veto power over the rest of our lives. And if you want to... Yeah, their rights are what are what we should be uh, worried about or concerned with. And if you want to uh, get rid of the filibuster with, you know, 50, 53 votes or so, uh, then you really absolutely have to use that opportunity to just pass statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico, like, immediately, day one. I'll be, I'll be interested to see who the first candidate who comes out and says, oh, yeah, we should get rid of that thing. Because I don't think anybody has yet said affirmatively. Well, the thing is, the thing is, it's a process issue, and process issues you, you just tend to avoid and, and to worry about. Also, and also, keep in mind, it, like, you're running for president. You're not running for president of the Senate. Exactly. Right, right. You there is a limited amount. I mean, this is something that all of the fucking Johns of the world kept harping on during Obama's uh, feckless first term. But it, there is truth to the fact that there is limited leverage that a president has over an individual member of the Senate. And also, you know, uh, like we said, liberals are, are very anxious and scared right now, as we see in this whole Howard Schultz thing. So they uh, are they will they will immediately their minds will go to, oh, no, what if we lose the Senate or what if we continue to not have the Senate? We can't say that that's going to empower and, the other side. And it's in the interest of individual senators to keep their influence by maintaining the filibuster. So if you've got all you need is like a, a handful of Democrats to say, yeah, no, we're not doing that. And then what can you do? Maybe you try to shame them publicly. Maybe you do, but like FB, FDR tried to do that. Nineteen. Uh, what's uh, actually going to work? The thing is, what's actually going to work, and work. it's this is technically a process right. issue, but it's way way clearer in people's minds is to stack the Supreme Court, and that's as easy as saying Donald Trump is an illegitimate president who put two illegitimate Supreme Court justices on the court, and so we're going to enlarge the size of the court, and I'm putting my justices on. Uh, that's easier to get people to rally around right now after the Kavanaugh hearings, and especially if RPG dies and Trump gets to appoint the replacement, it, liberals will go apoplectic. You brought you brought up the next guy I want to talk about the the next the next uh, duck to be you know hunted in this Democratic field, Howard Schultz. We haven't talked about him on the show since we were on stage in Seattle reading from his um yeah his dog brained fucking books and memoirs. I recommend going. We we did that as a we released that as a bonus when this whole he thing came out. The thing about him is, is that he didn't make his money selling coffee. He sold community. I he, saw he, Matt buy. I forget where he was writing, and he's got one of the oh, he's one of the worst. But he was like, you know, you may make fun of Howard Schultz, you know, or you may think he doesn't get politics, but like, who other than Howard Schultz has like you know changed America and like introduced coffee and like having coffee meetings you know like he's changed the culture of america in the way no one has and you know who can who can who can say they've done that that's a big thing well these guys love going to starbucks so they think hey the coffee is good maybe the governance would be good too okay the interesting thing about schultz is i mean who knows how far he's going to go with this i'm thoroughly convinced that this is just a grift by T. Steve Schmidt and any yeah. other consultant or political professional who's convinced him that he can run for president yeah. to line their pockets while the getting is good. Or I'm beginning to become more convinced that Howard Schultz knows he's a spoiler for the Democratic Party oh, yeah. and is trying to 
you basically run for president as insurance on Elizabeth Warren or Bernie getting the nomination or even potentially winning because, look, I'm sure he hates Trump and finds him to be gauche and awful and racist and whatnot, but he doesn't want his taxes raised. Of course, either. and uh, uh, Bloomberg did the exact same he thing. He said that explicitly. He didn't, yes. he didn't yes. have this, this book, uh, book tour rollout that Schultz does, uh, but he did put it out there of, I'm worried if it's Bernie versus... Uh, versus trump i'm gonna need to rescue america from extremism yeah and now they're doing it again and of course the same terrified liberals are like oh god no oh my god no well what this really is i mean again the election is 21 months away and uh, whatever filing deadlines uh that it would take for an independent candidacy are are probably like what 16 17 months away ross perot didn't uh, uh announce that he would be in the race until what april of 1992 or so so it's 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 very very premature, and I think the uh, the the left freak out over Howard Schultz right now, uh, you know that's just an anxiety of oh no the vote's going to be split and then Trump's going to wa- uh, win the presidency in a walk. I that to me just says that oh nobody's just internalized the actual uh, lessons of 2016, and we just sort of think in terms of we still have this we're we're still sort of uh, clinging to this uh, uh orthodox uh, uh view in political science of oh uh, you know the the electorate is a is a continuum that's e- evenly distributed and uh people make up their minds based on which candidates have positions closest to them that is absolutely 100% not the case if you're there no such thing as a never trump republican if you're a republican you're going to vote for trump yeah, he's going to get somewhere in the balance of 42 45% of the vote this time around he got 45.8% last time around that's it and enough piss off Democrats are not going to go to a third party like at the, uh, the day. Of, there's going to be a lot of bullshit in the election. But the day of the election in 2020, 21 months away, if you don't like Trump, you're voting for the Democrat because it's the only person who can possibly win. And, and that's it. And it doesn't help that Howard Schultz's big rollout of his vision was saying uh, you can't do anything. That's all. We don't have the money for anything. And also. Anyone trying to raise my taxes or be mean to me personally is uh, a communist well, what's and so an un-American. He calls everything un-American, which is so funny. It's a, uh, that's actually un-American to uh, give health care to people. Uh, actually, here's it's the, un-American what, what's to hilarious me. about Schultz, though, is that you know, every time I've seen him be interviewed about you know, this, this supposed presidential run or, or his defenders will be like, you know, he's offering something new. <laughs> he's he's so like he's changing like he's going to change the way we think about politics like something new what we need to uh cut the deficit you can never raise taxes um and i'm socially liberal fiscally conservative yeah. that is the ruling orthodoxy <laughs> of government and media and every everything in this country for at least 40 fucking years and yet has and no I, actual consistency there's no constituency, constituency there people. and that is what i think is interesting about schultz and you know what should be noted is that we like people have got to fucking realize the socially liberal, fiscally conservative thing is a contradiction in terms. No, it doesn't. It's exist. completely untenable. It makes no fucking sense. And what he's doing is, yeah, he's running for the constituency of p- rich people who find Trump and the Republican Party gauche and embarrassing because of the hooting yahoos that support them. And, you know, maybe they don't openly hate gay people. Uh, they don't. Uh, have any outward antagonism towards uh, black people or minorities of any kind, just so long as you know their kids don't have to school go to school with them, right. or they have to see or deal with them in any regard, or yeah. the idea that their ta- their that their money would go to you know benefit them in any way, um, yeah, like but essentially are Republicans. Yeah, they're Republicans, but they're embarrassed by the current state of the Republican Party, and they're like, ooh, I hate that I have to vote for Trump because he's so bad, and you know, if only there was a coffee genius yeah. that I could ro- vote for. And I think these people need to be exposed for what they are, yeah. which are, which are, are, are cowards and um, sycophants and just evil people overall. So like, that's why really you don't have to worry about Howard Schultz because anyone who I think might vote for him is probably just a Republican, basically. And that's it. And you can't expand the Democratic electorate to the right. One is it's just going to destroy the party. It's going to make it, you know, this fun- <laughs> fundamentally ungovernable coalition. Uh, and two is be, those people at the end of the day just want Republican Supreme Court justices. So fuck them. Stop paying attention to them. You don't have to win Max Boots' vote, especially when the majority of the country doesn't vote at all. Actually, and it's totally you do. disenfranchised. Yeah, no, you yeah, you, you, you must. You if you if if the Democrats can't win over Max Boots, I got to tell you, man. Last couple last week or so. He has reached maximum levels of boot. <laughs> no, the boot levels are off the chart. <laughs> first, first, he wrote the thing saying, we need to think of our engagement in Afghanistan the way that you think about the Indian wars of the plains <laughs> and the, like, the colonial wars of the British Empire. And people were like, that's pretty psychotic and racist. And he's like... Uh, and and then, then he wrote a column. He had to write a column he about... another column being like, the mob the came, mob for, came me. for me. And it's just like... 
you're a fucking opinion columnist. Yes. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry people didn't like your fucking column, but like that it's not Dude, it's, he's like you're doing. He's he's the guy. He's the guy who's now saying you're doing literal violence to me. Yeah. They're they're doing dog piling on me. But that's the thing. Eighty to ninety percent of opinion column writing now is people for the first time ever having to ha- read reader responses to their work, which they never used to have to do. What like two or three fucking uh, letters to the editor from known cranks, as opposed to five thousand people like calling you a fucking genocidal get, dipshit, get booted, and telling, bitch. <laughs> telling you that you're uh, more like minimum boot, uh, yeah. or and, making fun of his his stupid little hat. Yeah, I mean that and is so, the best. And so like that's already the number one sign that you're dealing with just a terminally narcissistic shithead is when they write a whole column about how wow, the mob the came gonna, for me, and then he follows that up by saying. You know, I I'm the I'm the voter that the Democrats need to to, to, to cater to. Yes, it's never, me, the guy who loves imperi- who the guy who's worried about entitlement spending because it makes it hard for us to afford eternal warfare. The guy a who very popular said, opinion that many Americans hold. <laughs> the, the, guy, the Americans are like, I will sacrifice my social security so that we could build a Fuddruckers in Kabul. <laughs> Not even that. No, because he's even he's abandoned nation building. He's just saying we need to commit to eternal warfare on the <laughs> frontiers of our empire for at least a few centuries. Yeah. I and like that Max Wood has just been reading Howard's in. <laughs> yeah. I, no, he's right. That is, yeah, exactly. that is how I view our, our, our various imperial adventures. Well, that's the thing. That's, what's so, that's why this moment is so breathtaking because you're seeing like all of this fucking artifice fall away. I mean, it's dispiriting when you watch the Super Bowl, but then you, know, you watch something like Howard Schultz run an insurgent third-party campaign where all of the... Un- challenged premises of the, the the bipartisan consensus are revealed and people are like oh yeah that sucks we don't like that or maximum boot a guy who in gener- who in his own lifetime said no these wars are about freedom and ex- expanding human you know uh, possibility and democracy and not just yeah no we're just an empire and we have to maintain our imperial influence we have a, what like it's all just coming out now <laughs> <laughs> but to your point about um how every other opinion column now is is uh these incredibly cosseted uh, morons <laughs> having to deal with the fact that like they have to like put something out there and like nobody wants to you know no one wants to s- i've in- i've deleted the comment about how uh we need to big heap scalp our enemies <laughs> <laughs> in afghanistan because uh i realized i have to be more careful about my words but the more important i realize thing i realized is that the mob has taken over and we must stand f- uh, firmly against them. This is actually the next segue into my we the next to, thing. We, we, we need to police the frontiers of my mentions. Yeah. <laughs> this is a nice segue into the next thing I want to talk about, about how sort of the internet has uh, changed uh, the way we react to things and made us aware of things that otherwise wouldn't have, would have caught on. I'm talking, of course, about the hilarious ralph northam blackface scandal oh boy. that's going oh on gosh. right now oh yeah he's in deep you know and he's trying to hold on he's having all hands on decks meetings just being like just give me away just give me a way out of this that i, I can hang on or what? that i can just weather Apparently, this storm his when- new his latest thing today he had a cabinet meeting where he said he's not going to resign and he begged his cabinet to give him time to prove that he is not in the yearbook picture as either the Klansman or the guy in blackface. <laughs> that is the premise of an 80s movie. It's like Steve Johnson, who had thought he had it all. He was the governor of a major state. But now he has 72 hours to prove <laughs> that he wasn't doing blackface. <laughs> and then also, uh, his nickname was Coon Man. Coon Man. <laughs> Coon Man. That's not it. <laughs> that's, that's not on, as they say in the old Blighty. Just- but like we were talking about this, it's just like this shit was just like so prevalent. Like white people love doing blackface oh, in yearbooks, white people which are preserved it. forever. And the thing is, as we know, every year on Halloween, white people, even still in the era do of it. the woke era of the of the Instagram era of the era of dragging, still can't not it's do something blackface. in their it's something in their DNA. Like like salmon just know to swim upstream to the same spawning location. <laughs> it, it's, white people like the the. the blood moon comes out on Halloween <laughs> and they immediately go to CVS and buy some fucking black nail yeah, polish. It's, it's the Al Jolson gene. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, the Northam thing. So funny. Dude, well, I, and this was a week I, after I, another blackface scandal from the uh, fucking Secretary Florida State Secretary Florida. of State. He was doing it in 2005. And then what was the Northam thing? At the, he was like, uh, it, uh, it wasn't me in the photo, 
but I did do blackface at another event. There was a dance competition in which I moonwalked like Michael Jackson and had like a slightly lighter hue of blackface on. And then at the press conference, someone was like, can you still moonwalk? And he was about to fucking do it until his <laughs> wife stopped him. But, which make I, Ralph Northam's wife villain of the week. Absolutely. For, ding, ding, for, ding, 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 ding. Ralph Northam's wife villain of the week. For robbing us, the governor of Virginia, of the, moonwalking. For seeing Ralph Northam prove he can st- try to moonwalk at a press conference about his blackface coon man scandal. I don't. I don't think there's ever been a more direct uh, representation of the turning a dial to see how yeah, to, how racist, racist can I be. be. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, well, I, and also, an if you're if you are playing Michael Jackson like, during the moonwalk era, like maybe I can understand if Jackson Five. You just really love doing blackface <laughs> because that was when he was already getting kind of light. What's his name? Corey Feldman when he was doing all that Michael Jackson yeah. stuff. He wasn't tanned. It's like everyone gets it. To do everyone it. Does, yeah. He's the one guy. He, 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 he moonwalks. He was also, by that point, already lightening his skin pretty significantly. You just really like doing blackface at that point. Yeah, You're just you like, yeah, I guess I got it. Just a little. Just, just come on, man. Just, My daddy needs a little bit. Just a little bit of bronzer. <laughs> just, just, just a little bit on the cheeks. I mean, is this is this like a southern thing? I mean, this was like you know, what is it? Virginia? I mean, it is a southern yeah. thing, but it's also a everywhere else thing too. Yeah, I mean, that, people that was, just love like, doing black. Like George Wallace the, said the whole nation is the South. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, that was the last straw with Megyn Kelly recently, where yeah, she just didn't. Like, What's the big deal? It's my yeah, case. but yeah, we just want to. There's sort of like a how about a brief history yeah. of blackface scandals? Because for a long time, there was no such thing as exactly. A blackface That's what I'm scandal. saying is like. Th- this would happen, and like because of the internet was now everything on the internet is forever, and it, it immediately opens you up to like a kind of universal instant response that is just instantly proliferated everywhere. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, as opposed, it's, it's because of the internet and wokeness. Because up to like the the mid nineties, uh, everyone was doing blackface at all times, <laughs> and nobody could, no white person could fathom that that was bad in some way because their you know society is just segregated. Well, fucking Strom Thurmond and Jesse Helms were in the Senate. And they were in senior positions because they'd been there f- since they were Dixiecrats, for fuck's sake. And you like, and you can't, you can't imagine, like, you know, if you're if you're a political consultant in 1988 or so, looking for Oppo on your on your on your opponents, uh, you're just get, going through like, yearbook after yearbook, and all you see is blackface photos. Like, no, get me something good. Yeah. <laughs> get, me, <laughs> I mean, I mean, some, get me something good on Gary Hart. Yeah, you know, give me funny somebody story. Those Joe big... Biden, when he plagiarized that speech, what he was doing it in blackface. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was part of the scandal. Just give me a guy in one of those Russian fur hats. If he's a, if he's a Democrat, that's way better than blackface. I, I, it does just make me curious about like deep in state houses of like every state house below the the Mason Dixon. Just how many photos of former governors in blackface there are, just moldering in basements. It's like uh, or like they're either they're doing blackface or they're having like uh, a dinner party that's like plantation themed, <laughs> <laughs> where it's just like oh like oh I'm 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 white in this in this scenario <laughs> for sure. <laughs> But what you're talking about, I think the first actual blackface scandal in America was the Ted Danson roast of Whoopi Goldberg, yes. who he was dating at the time. And he did it in like the full big old like white, With the, the lips. white lips yeah. and everything. And all the jokes were about how white black women's vaginas were big. I and, remember that part. And I think that, that was actually the Hot dog f- down a hallway. Absolutely. He Jesus. remembers. Uh, Real heads know. Good God. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, Ted Dan, one of the whitest guys. <laughs> oh yeah, the whitest man. Survived uncanceled to this day. Yeah, but and now he's like actually... so white that his hair and his skin. Is <laughs> but like, I think that was actually the first irony blackface yeah. scandal because, of course, uh, Whoopi, as we know from the uh, Apu documentary, yeah. has a huge collection of like m- minstrel, you right. know, advertisements yeah. and toys and things like that. And she loved. Uh, she was dating Ted Danson at the time and thought it was hilarious. Yeah. That well, he wasn't it? So wasn't it was her idea to do yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I and think so, so. I think he it got was. dragged. Talk about. Samson and Delilah. Right? And dragged for a little bit, but there wasn't really such a thing as dragging because yeah. there was no social media. But it, it went away pretty quickly. I mean, he never lost a job, and he he's been like uninterruptedly on television at, during from that period till now. Oh my god! And I totally forgotten. Just last week, you know, I'm sorry, ten thousand years ago, <laughs> those fucking Covington Catholic high school students yeah. with that thing where it's just like, uh, yeah. 
oh, how, how dare you say these kids are racist? And then, like, these people, to defend them, were literally showing videos of basketball games where the, the kids in the crowd were in fucking blackface. Black body. And they were, like, full and, black. And then, like, the, the idiot who was just, like, was just, like, wow, here comes the mob. I can't believe they're trying to do these, the, you know, what they're doing to these kids is disgusting. It's a blackout game. It's a normal thing that happens at high schools everywhere. And it was just, I don't know, maybe wearing everyone wears a black T-shirt, but uh, black skin <laughs> and then the white lips. I mean, and, th- and this was like, this is now. This, yeah. These are kids in high school now. Yeah. And it's like, that is, that is some powerful, powerful racism. Like we say, like, it's like, like there's, a, there's a genetic component. It's like the thing that allows you to, to, to digest lactose also makes you want to do blackface. This should be just the the generic rejoinder for any time, like any conservative shithead is like, oh well, the, the people the left tries to to elevate the racial issue, and we really have done a long way to solve it. You just have to point out that blackface is still a huge problem in America, well into the twenty first century. Yeah, like this is a, a, a high school basketball game. It's like a it's like a big like you know it's like a community thing that's that's public in that thing, and like there are teachers there and things like. And I'm just like everyone's in blackface, and like nobody's just like, "Hey, this maybe maybe we you shouldn't do that." Yeah. I don't know. Maybe this maybe this is wrong, uh, or or the, or the, or claiming that there's absolutely no racial element in yeah. this whatsoever. I, you can't tell someone don't do blackface because that means that you can't do it later when you want to do. Blackface. Well, uh, one of the things I read <laughs> one of the things I read about Northam today is that he says he doesn't want to resign because he'll be tagged forever as like the racist guy. But that's because he thinks he could. Fix this. He thinks that there's some CG, like CSI, like face recognition, zoom in and enhance software that will somehow definitively prove that it wasn't him. He's going. If I could get a uh, like little consultant mode right now, he's got to pull some jujitsu and just start doing blackface now <laughs> and act like it's totally okay and be confused when people get mad at him. Just say, "Wait, no, I thought this was fine. I don't wait. That's just called blackface. I w- I thought blackface was a different thing." But, but this is just what I do. But I, I mean, we, we talk about the prevalence of this and how baffling it is. But honestly, the blackface scandals do have a meaningful. Uh, they they form a meaningful function in the American political uh, digestive system, in that they provide this the uh, episodic, uh, cathartic, symbolic acts of humbling to make up for the absolute lack of any real material progress on racial outcomes in America for the last 30 years. Like nothing has gotten better for black people in the like 30 years. It's gotten actually significantly worse yeah. since the, the, uh, the crash, but every year or so some dipshit puts on blackface and he gets dragged now. And that can give you like the little symbolic thing of like we're making progress, right? right because that's the thing. Because if, if 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 Covington High School just passed around a memo saying, "By the way, don't do blackface," okay, that hasn't really get, made any structural change, right? We've exactly. Just, we've stamped out the blackface or just made it, you know, a passe to do. Yeah. And meanwhile, all you then have is, oh yeah, nothing's getting better. But if some jamoke can get owned and lose his job for doing blackface, then we are making progress. I do also like the thing, uh, especially in the post-Trump era, of the uh, how when scandals like this come up in the Democratic Party or on the left in general, like this or like say the Franken thing, how there'll be the initial reaction from like some conservative guys of being like, "Oh, now the Democrats have a guy fucking up on their side. We'll see how willing they are to throw him under the bus." And then immediately everybody is like, "No, fuck this guy. Eric, He's gotta go." Eric Erickson did exactly that this week, where he was like, "I I deleted this tweet." He what he did is like his original thing was like. Uh, wow, for the party that thinks, you know, wearing a hat is racist, like, we'll see how they react to their, you know, governor, a Democratic governor doing blackface. And then, of course, immediately everyone was like, he should resign. <laughs> and Eric was like, deleted the original tweet because, you know, the reaction uh, went against what I was saying. But thinking about it now, it was 35 years ago. <laughs> and are we really going to, you know, condemn a man for so, you know, something he did that long ago? Yeah, because that's yeah, the Eric, only way. It was the Eric, fucking Eric, 80s when that happened. Yeah. We were talking about this. There used to be a movie I would watch on Comedy Central. They would play it every other week called Soul Man C. from, the, from the 80s with C. Thomas Howell that was attempting to make like a non-racist point by a movie about a guy <laughs> who uh, pretends to be black to get into Harvard because of affirmative action or something. But to get a scholarship. To get a scholarship. He got, he's a, it's actually horrifying when you think about it. <laughs> I, I, I watched this movie a million times too. The premise is that C. Thomas Howell is the callow son of a super rich asshole who gets he's into the Harvard. nephew that you end up having to pay the ransom right. for because he's too much exactly. of a shithead. Har- Har- he gets into Harvard and he's like, great, I'm going to go to Harvard. 
But his dad says, I'm going to try to give you, I'm going to toughen you up. I'm going to make you pay for it. And, of course, he freaks out. And instead of doing literally anything else, he uses an experimental skin skin darkeners and applies for a scholarship that's set aside for black students. Uh, Weird race science. And then he ends up... (laughs) That's very funny. That's excellent. That's very good. Uh, He ends up dating actual black woman at Harvard, Radon Chong, who was the person who he beat for the scholarship. Oh, and wow. then, of course, they end up together instead of her murdering. <laughs> <laughs> and like James Earl Jones is James her father is, or something. Yeah. Well, he's I think, he, or the dean or something like he's, that. He's the John Hausman, okay, like, yeah, yeah. distinguished professor guy. But but going back to the Eric Erickson and then uh, the earlier like mask off thing, it's just hilarious because it's the only thing they ever have is like when they're like, oh, well, now let's see if the left thinks racism ba- is bad, and everybody's like, well, yeah, racism's bad, and then they, the only thing they have left is, well, actually, racism's good, and it's or okay, or, it's or just saying like. Uh, Oh, you know, our culture has just become too punitive. And, you know, yeah, the mob, once again, the mob has spoken. Hilarious. Ralph, I, I mean, honestly, I hope he try. I hope he keeps trying to stick it out. I just I just, just want dance, him to find dude. the real blackface. <laughs> <laughs> him and OJ can get together. You know what they should do? They should swap. OJ finds the real blackface guy. Ralph Northam finds the real killer. It all works out. He's doing focus groups right now to be like, what would be more harmful if I cop to the blackface or the clan robe and hood? <laughs> I think everyone seems to be on the same page that uh, the clan hood would be worse. Mm. That seems like, I mean, I don't know. I haven't really yeah, thought about it, but a lot of people seem to be like, yeah, clan hood would be worse. <laughs> Real Sophie's choice yeah. for Ralph North. But the problem is, is that he's wearing a hood in that picture. So I, it's sort of, he can't prove that isn't him. <laughs> Because you can't see the face. They're going to have to do the, uh, the the graphic analysis like Ben Shapiro and the flag. To uh, also, out how tall he is. also, hilariously, you know, Hillary Land. Uh, I saw Tom Watson the other day. Like, Bernie had a statement that was like, I think Northam should resign. This is no good. And Tom Watson was like, wow, better late than never after everyone else has already said this. You know, tone deaf Bernie and all. It's like. Uh, Bernie campaigned for the guy who ran against him yeah. in the Democratic yeah. primary. And then <laughs> Bernie did, famously did not inv- endorse Ralph Northam, which everyone got pissed about. And then Northam won in a landslide, and they use this as a, as a talking point that, you know, oh, looks like the Bernie left. We don't need the Bernie. And I got to say, away. though, like the guy that he did endorse, Tom Perillo, like, what the fuck, man? You can't look at a fucking... Yeah, who... Book. Yeah, just, I will well, never go on one of your tours of Italy, sir. Well, well it, did, it did turn out later. I thought I saw that uh, Northam had asked Bernie not to step in. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, they the, thought the it was going to be bad for yeah. him in, in, in Raytheon Acres. And uh, people were yelling at him for not, uh, for not supporting Northam. And he didn't say anything about it because Bernie is a gentleman and does not w- say when he doesn't or, put, like, throw he doesn't other people put under his the bus. drama on the streets. Well, uh, this actually gets to the last thing I want to talk about uh, that I, I took note of this week. This hilarious thing that's going on right now, it's like all sourced to this one Twitter account. It's this woman, something Mendoza. And whenever I see it, I just think of McBain from The Simpsons going, Mendoza! Where it's like they've, uh, they're sort of leaking the, the Bernie Oppo file, which includes all these videos from his time uh, in Vermont. And like it's when all, he was way cooler than And it's all now. coming out now as these things like, wow, cannot believe we didn't see this in 2016. I'm like, shit, I wish we fucking did. Maybe he would have won. But like yeah. all Bernie. these videos of him um, being cool and being right. Owning libs. And it, it's like it's all set up to be like, wow, this is incredibly damning. But like each one of them are more hilarious than the next. And the, the really funny one recently was like he's talking to a classroom of kids about how racial stereotypes are dehumanizing and stupid and wrong. And like he gives voice to uh, racial stereotypes about like, you know, when I was a kid. You know, uh, they said that black people uh, smelled and it was just like and, and then goes into like talking about uh, stereotypes about Jews and about how they're, you know, miserly or whatever. And like the woman posting it is literally trying to portray that it's evidence of him actually saying what like racist things about yeah. black people. No, it's a classic rock bottom type situation. Yeah. You know, I touched her sweet hand. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what, I, what I like about it, so the, these are all videos from Bernie's time as he was the independent mayor of Burlington, Vermont, and he was very, very cool as mayor. Like, I remember he was uh, um, openly in support of the Sandinistas yeah. in, like, 1982. He tried to give Burlington a foreign policy. It was pretty good. <laughs> no, that's what he said. And uh, as far as I can tell, this woman is going through some database of Burlington public access. Uh, which a had lot, a-, a lot of hemp necklaces and, uh, and fucking... 
uh, maple syrup yeah, tutorials. I can't wait to watch 700 hours of the Fish Live Set review show <laughs> to see if there's any <laughs> comments on Bernie's Burlington foreign yeah. policy. Like, you got to go through 500 hours of a guy making uh, Birkenstocks out of wicker. And uh, from what I can tell, I mean, for one, you know, it's pretty clear that this woman's brain has been irreparably damaged by the Internet. Now it's being irreparably damaged by going through hundreds of hours of Burlington 80s public access VHSs in some database. I have no idea where it's from. Uh, so and many... she can't even the thing is, she doesn't even articulate a critique of any of these videos. She doesn't explain why it's bad. She just, thinks, she just presents just, them she, as she, they are self-evidently She horrific. starts a sentence and then just can't even end them and, and just sort of goes to, uh, hmm, this is troubling to me. This is problematic. And the content of the actual videos, one, one she posted recently, was Bernie talking about Martin Luther King, talking about the poor people's campaign and uh, uh, how, you know, oh, uh, the whole establishment turned on him when he posed the Vietnam War and when he started organizing white and black workers uh, against poverty and for federal jobs program. Uh, which is all like a, a true and mainline, you know, left uh, uh, left point to make. Uh, and uh, all she said was, uh, mm, here's Bernie calling Asians yellow. Mm, seems <laughs> seems problematic to me. And the, the very first clip that she released is, you know, from one of these debates where he talks about you know, why he's a socialist. And he says, I'm a socialist because I want a radical redistribution of wealth and power in America. And she was just like. Wow. Wow. I can't believe we haven't heard this, you know, before. This is scary stuff. And if anything, it proves that if anything, it proves that he was better back then. Yeah. He had more a little bit more spark to him back then. Well, I didn't I mean, have as much to lose. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to hear more of that from him now. I mean, it, it, really, it also just shows that he's been basically saying the same thing for over yeah. 30 years now and has been right about it. Yeah. Give me young Bernie, young Bernie, young uh, cinema uh, unity ticket. Young, yeah, seriously, when she was dumpster diving. <laughs> Freegan, yeah. yeah. Dumpster diving and uh, comparing uh, American soldiers to skeletons. <laughs> 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 oh, man. It is hilarious, though. Keep those videos coming. Yeah. Oh, she was shirtless, singing in the... Yeah, she, her, she's going to need to serious therapy to cope with watching all those hours of, like, uh, like Hampshire College assistant professors, uh, you know, <laughs> just like talking about their divorce or whatever the fuck is on there. I can't even wait. Uh, Bernie in the USSR taking off his shirt and singing union songs, uh, going pretty hard for the Matt Chrisman vote. <laughs> <laughs> Not a fan of the shirtlessness, but I did enjoy the singing. Keep your shirt on. All men, keep your shirt on. So, uh, yeah, I think that about uh, wraps it up for this week. Yeah. Cheers. I, I do want to say... Uh, you know, again, congratulations to you if you've tuned in to our halftime stream and our uh, second half coverage of the big game and our post game coverage with all the special guests. Thanks to everyone who made that work, especially Chris Wade uh, in the office. Uh, if you uh, if you want to support community theater, uh, subscribe to us at twitch.tv slash Chapo Trap House. If you happen to have an Amazon Prime account, you automatically have Twitch Prime, which entitles you to one uh, free subscription you can give. Uh, to the streamer of your choice. And uh, if it's all the same to you, instead of using that free subscription on a 17-year-old a uh, Scandinavian guy who plays Fortnite and yells foreign racial slurs, uh, bequeath it to us at Chapel So Trap you can House. watch Felix do that same thing. Uh, I would also like to add that if you uh, work at Crooked Media and are a secret gray wolf, uh, get in touch with me. I'd like a mole on the inside. Cheers, everybody. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.